Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today we'll be talking about lifelong learning. Joanne Hawkins is Associate Vice President for Continuing Education and Workforce Development at Howard Community College in Maryland. Kim Molesky is author of Learn Something New Every Day. Librarian and researcher at National Public Radio, he is also the author of All Facts Considered. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Key, maybe if we could start with you. Uh, can you tell us a little something about your book? Because it's kind of an interesting concept to just put a bunch of facts in a book. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, Learn Something New Every Day um, is my second collection of facts. And this is a year's worth to take you through with a fact for every day of the year. And in talking with my editor after the first book, um, and trying to come up with an idea for a second one. And he said, well, why did you become a librarian anyway? And I said, because you learn something new every day. And he said, that, that's the title. Uh, and I think that is something that, that draws many people to the library profession, the joy of learning, um, the, the idea that we want to learn and share what we learn with other people. We want to encourage people's curiosity about the world uh, and, and urge them to, to keep learning because it, it's good for you and it's interesting and it's exciting and it's fun. And one way I tried to kind of inspire myself before I started the researching and writing was to go through and see what great thinkers have said about the importance of education um, over the centuries. And actually one of my favorite was Dr. Seuss. Who, uh, who once wrote, um, a young cat, if you uh, keep yourself open, you keep your eyes open enough, uh, all the wonderful stuff you will learn. And I think that, you know, as I say, is something that librarians want to share with people everywhere. And one other interesting fact about the book is that, um, of course, as a librarian, every fact had to have sources. Uh, you can't tell the whole story of any fact in a, just a couple of hundred words. So there are lots of sources, many of which are online. So we came up with the idea to put all the notes and sources on my website, keymoleski.com, so that I could continue to update them, correct them, add more information, because um, facts do change. Uh, scientific research, cultural, uh, popular opinion, events will modify certain things and something that was a fact in the past may not be a fact any longer and this way um, I hope to inspire people to keep learning more about anything in the books that they find interesting or intriguing. Interesting. And Joanne, in terms of facts, uh, do you teach facts or do you teach things beyond facts? How do you, your, does your institution look at that? We like to think we teach everything. We certainly start with facts and then we go on. We look towards critical thinking. We look of how you use those facts, how you employ them in a day-to-day -day basis. We try, like Key said, to encourage people to keep on learning. That's the key. We want them to learn in whatever way is most comfortable for them and in whatever direction that they need to go. Well, that's why I wanted to do this segment today, because I think in, in this era, there's a change, or there are changes as to how people learn. And I was interested in the role, uh, you know, from your, where you sit, Joanne, is how does your institution provide learning options and opportunities for people when they could simply just sit in front of their computer at midnight and, <laughs> and read some stuff? Well, that's not necessarily bad. It goes back to what your intent is. We try and offer a more robust form of education. So we have the traditional credit leading towards a degree or a certificate. But even in the credit area, what we find is that people are coming back who already have degrees, and they're picking up additional knowledge or certifications. My area is non-credit. Our youngest student is six, our oldest is 97. Our 97-year-old took a wellness course, which I think is, <laughs> is great. We um, offer a variety of courses in personal and professional enrichment. We have an active kids program in the summer. We do adult basic ed because even in a county like Howard County, which is highly educated, there's a percentage of the population that does not have a high school diploma and it's almost impossible to succeed today without that diploma. We have a large population that doesn't speak English as a first language, so we have that kind of training. 
we do licensures, we do certifications. So as an educational institution, we offer all kinds of opportunities. Well, what kind of certificate would I get at Howard Community College? It would depend on what you wanted. You could get um, a certificate in graphic design, which could be credit. You could come to non-credit. If you were looking to get into the job market and you did not have formal education or a lot of formal education, you could get a certificate to become a certified nursing assistant or a commercial driver's license. You could get a certificate in child care. You could get a certificate in motorcycle safety so you could then get a license. So it's a, it's a whole gamut. It really goes back to what you want and what you need. Well, let's get to motorcycle safety. I had no idea you were going to mention that. <laughs> okay, let me hope I have the answers. <laughs> and I don't know if there are any facts key that you have about motorcycle safety. I don't safety. think I have, no. <laughs> but let's say I was interested in motorcycle safety. Does that mean I ride a motorcycle and now I want to be a safer driver, or does that mean I want to... you have to have that certificate in order to get your motorcycle license within the state of Maryland. So you have a basic rider's course, which begins with classroom, in class, and then actually on the range. And would I pay tuition yes. for that? Yes, mm -hmm. you would. And I would not get credit or I would only get credit towards that? You would not get official credit that could be applied to a degree. You would get a certificate from us indicating that you had successfully completed the course if you had indeed successfully completed the course. And Key, in terms of, of, of facts, uh, we're, we're talking about learning things and we're talking about applying things. Do you have any thoughts about the difference between learning a fact because it's interesting and then learning how to drive a motorcycle safely? <laughs> no. I should have brought a helmet for yeah, you, yeah. Uh, Well, of, you know, of course there's a difference between fact and knowledge and, and understanding. Um, a fact is just, you know, a datum of information or experience. Knowledge is a fact in context. Understanding then even goes to the next level of really deep comprehension, uh, empathy, discernment about that. So the difference between, okay, I, you know, there's a motorcycle, I guess I could turn the key and turn it on, versus operating it safely so that I and the other people on the road are uh, not in any serious danger perhaps then gets us to the level of, of understanding. Uh, my example, I had thought of a fact, for example, the sky is blue. Um, knowledge would be um, knowing the scientific reason that the sky is blue, that there's dust particles and they act as a prism and light is diffracted. And understanding perhaps would involve uh, knowing the story of John Tyndall, the man who first figured out why the sky is blue, and knowing more of the physics about how light acts, and perhaps knowing what color the sky would appear to be if you were standing on another planet. So there's you know, definitely levels of the depth, fact, knowledge, understanding, and depending on what the topic is and what your interest in that topic is, how far you go and how you get there. I wonder how we get more people interested in true understanding than just facts. I think that's your job, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you, you get them engaged. You make them understand the value of learning and what it can mean to them. So, you know, it's what's in it for me, which sounds commercial, but it's true. So you give them examples of what they can do if they have, if they've taken those facts and they've taken them further to really knowledge or understanding. One of the things we hear consistently from employers is that they are not only looking for students who know how to wire a computer or do a graphic arts program, they're looking for students who can engage with others. They want teamwork, they want critical thinking, they want problem solving. If you have just the facts, you don't get to that next level. So it's our job to convince people that there is value in learning. And is there a difference between value in, in taking one course versus then taking a series of courses? Depends on what that one course is and what your intent is. If you um, say you've decided you're going to Italy this summer and you take Italian for travelers, that just gets you enough to say, you know, where is the bathroom, how much does this cost, and where is the next pizza coming from? But if you decide that you really are in love with the Italian language, well then you move on and you take a much more structured course that includes grammar and 
literature and it's just more intense. I think the role for any kind of library in this is to make all of those options right. available. And in many ways, technology is making that easier. Unfortunately, we live in an economic time when not everyone is realizing the value of libraries and the absolutely essential uh, impact that they have on this idea of learning and lifelong learning and the number of people who have few resources other than their public libraries to turn to. And so again, making as many options available and then the librarians being there to help guide you through what's appropriate for you and, and your needs. I think that's really important because there is so much knowledge that's th being thrown at us, so much information. Mm -hmm. If you're not a skilled learner, you need someone mm -hmm. to say, let me take you down this direction right. or, or focus here. So I think right. that the role of a librarian is just absolutely right. essential. People used to think of us as gatekeepers, you know, sort of protecting the information and letting you in a little bit at a time. And I don't know that that was ever the feeling of the librarians, but definitely now I think that we do think of ourselves as guides, as we need to be familiar with so many different kinds of resources, ways of accessing information, and then help each person figure out what is right for him or her. And that's the most important thing to me. We're not in the business of telling people how they should learn. We're in the business of telling them they should learn and offering them yeah. a number of various options to get there. Fair enough. <laughs> in, in, terms of, in terms of these options, I'm interested in the option of a student, or let's say a working adult, who decides, you know, I like my job a little bit, I might want a different job. What am I, I going to do? How would I interact with Howard Community College or some other school at that point? Well, the first thing I would tell you to do is go to a career counseling center. Howard Community College has an excellent one. And they'll talk to you about you know, what your skills are, give you some tests if you need them, personality tests, uh, occupational tests, and then look at what the curriculum offers. Um, how much time do you have? How do you like to learn? Are you an in-class person? Do you need that face-to-face? -face? Could you do hybrid, which is a combination of online? And what is it that you want to go, and how quickly do you want to get there? So are you interested in something that's condensed? Are you more interested in something that will take um, a longer period of time? And are you interested in enhancing a current skill? So say right now you're in computers. Your next level is cyber computers, cybersecurity. So you take the certificate that's going to get there. Or are you an engineer and you're deciding now you want to be a sculptor? And that is actually, we actually had um, a student who did that. Well, there is some basis in engineering for sculpting, but is it a radical career change or is it a modification of the change? So you start with your career counseling and then you determine what it is you want and how the best way to get there. It could either be a formal credit degree, it could be a non-credit course, it could be one course, it could be a series of courses. And Key, let's pretend that you were not at National Public Radio and let's <laughs> pretend you were not a librarian there. Okay. You were instead a librarian at a community college, and a student came to you and, and, and was thinking about some of the things that, we just that Joanne just mentioned. How would you, what resources would you point them to in the library? Well, I mean, you know, it's all about the internet, you know, the magical webs. Um, so I would probably start with that, but maybe begin by focusing on, you know, what are the primary kinds of sources for this information, you know, before we get into the more popular areas. So is there organizations, associations, are there institutes at universities, are there government agencies? Um, obviously the answer would depend entirely on what kind of topics we were looking at. Um, and then what are the resources in the library? Um, again, you know, starting online, there might be a nice collection of journal articles, there might be certainly lists of books, but of course, not every book that's ever been published is available in the magic black box on your desk. And so you would be going to the shelves and browsing in a particular area and seeing what's the, you know, the deeper background on this topic that I'm looking for. And at some point, you know, very likely, you'll want to talk to or, or reach out to an expert or a practitioner or just fellow enthusiasts and get some other sense of you know, what's the current thinking in this area, what's going on right now. And then maybe you sign up for you know, an email alert or an RSS feed or you take a class 
or you join a group or you know all of that and the you know progression leads you I mean it can be in a direct straight line staying on a very specific topic but we also go off on all kinds of wonderful tangents and that's someplace sometimes that's the place where you wind up that you realize you always wanted to be I think one of the most important things is determining um, do you want a job mm -hmm. so if you want a job you look at the Department of Labor statistics and determine what fields are right. hot where you're right. more likely to get a job what the salary ranges are and then as Key said we strongly in, uh, encourage inter informational interviews so if I wanted to be a TV host I'd come to you and I'd say okay Steve what is it really like it's really great is it good okay well then there's my next career but you you do talk to people in the field not so much to get a job but to find out what it is I had a friend who worked at the college and she decided she wanted to be an insurance agent so she actually resigned her position and went and did that and was not it was not for her so she came back to the college so it's a mm. trial and error sometimes no but let's say I live in in Howard County Maryland yes okay which is your home turf <laughs> yes and, and 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 Howard Community College offers something I want that's great okay. and I'll sign up for it and I'll take it but let's say Howard doesn't offer that and I need to take a class in something that perhaps is offered uh, at an institution in California well, the obvious answer is, other than moving to California, is online. Um, distance learning has really expanded learning opportunities. And there are many forums, the, the, the MOOCs, the massive online open courses, certainly have uh, added to it. But there, there really is almost no reason now that you, to not get an education. Uh, even in technical fields, they're, they're working on simulations of virtual laboratories so that people don't have to be in a physical space to learn something. So their distance learning has leveled the field, I think. How do other countries deal with distance learning? With distance learning, it depends on the country. Um, some are much more engaged. Certainly you're going to have to have the infrastructure. So in a third world country where there is not a robust internet or there is not access to the internet or where people don't have computers, it's not going to be as um, likely for their population to advance. And certainly in Europe, um, that's not an issue. And Key, in terms of overseas, since we're on the topic of other countries, how do libraries work in terms of the resources in other countries? Do they work in, this, in similar ways to the way our libraries do? I'm really familiar primarily with news libraries because my entire career has been there. And, and from the librarians I know in other countries, it is very similar. Um, you know, many of their primary sources are available online that a news library would need to refer to, the government agencies, the important uh, academic institutions, and, and those kinds of things. But I really don't have any direct contact with, with libraries in, in other countries, other than through my library association where there are news librarians, um, particularly in the English-speaking parts of the world that, that I do know. Fair enough. Uh, in terms of men and women, uh, we've had a lot of uh, debates over the years mm -hmm. about men and women learning differently. Do you find that in terms of continuing education and lifelong learning that more women uh, are engaged uh, at Howard or more men? Well, 68% of our students, the non-credit students, are uh, female. On the credit side, it's 48%. So yes, traditionally, at least in community colleges, um, the population is more female. But we're moving away from the stereotypes. Um, it used to be they would say to you that men are only going to take engineering courses and science and computers and women are only going to take humanities. That's no longer true. So you're seeing men and women um, taking a variety of courses. One of the best experiences for me is to walk into one of our courses. I try and take one of our courses pretty much every year and you see such a wide range of ages mm -hmm. and interests. I took a French course. We had two 17-year-olds that were going on to uh, universities. We had a man that worked at the State Department that wanted to pick up another language. 
we had two women who were seniors who were groupies of this particular instructor. So it just, it really varies. Well, then what explains that 20% differential between the 68% and the 48% that you mentioned a second ago? Because it's credit and non-credit. Remember, credit, they're looking towards getting a degree. Uh, they're, uh, it's more transfer or a certificate. Non-credit, a lot of that is discretionary income. People with more time on their hands. So I think that it explains it somewhat. Fair enough. Keith, do more women than men listen to National Public Radio? No, I, I think the, the numbers, I, I'm not really on top of our demographic, but I think the, the gender breakdown is, in, is not terribly different. I think they're within a few points of each other. Fair enough. And I guess my, I, I wanted to ask the question about, to get back to this issue of the facts versus the understanding. Because a lot of universities claim that if you come to us, great university on the Hill, that we will now understand a lot more. But there's been a lot of debate as to whether or not that's really happening. A lot of employers are saying that, well, universities aren't producing students who can jump right into jobs. It goes back to the critical thinking skills. The concern is that within a curriculum, you have to make sure that there is problem solving you have to make sure that there's teamwork. You have to make sure that they're working with diverse populations. You have to give them real world experience. And um, certainly I can't speak for everything, but I, the community colleges do that. I mean, we have all kinds of initiatives where we emphasize that. So that when our students get out, they're not in an isolated, in you know, the old ivory tower concept they know what it is like. Certainly we um, stress internships. We do service learning where our students go and work in third world countries or they go to New York and work in a soup kitchen or they went to New Orleans and helped rebuild after Katrina. So they understand what's really happening. That's what employers want people who can come in, work well with others, be given an assignment, but know when it's necessary to go beyond it. Would you agree on that? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Would you say that community colleges do that better than traditional colleges? Well, I would say that, but I'm coming from a community college. I think you would have to ask that question to someone coming from a, a university. I think all educational institutions um, have the same goals. It's how they apply them. And certainly now there is a national completion agenda which is coming from the federal government and from the president. So I think you're looking, you're going to see more and more institutions focusing on allowing students to complete in a reasonable time without accumulating a lot of debt, making sure that they understand what is happening, what the jobs are. The other trend that's really interesting is we are more and more training students to become entrepreneurs because the concept of working 20 years for one institution and getting the gold watch at the end no longer exists. So we're telling our students, you have to be able to create your own job, particularly if you're an artist, a musician. We're teaching them entrepreneurial skills so that they can sell themselves because the reality is, is they may have 10 jobs in 10 years where mm -hmm. that didn't happen anymore. Okay. Well, Key, in some ways, you are an artist. Um, you're a librarian, but you are an author. You work at National Public Radio, but you're wearing your hat here today as an author of a book that seems to be doing pretty well. Yeah. So do you consider yourself to be an artist? Uh, I have not thought of it that way, although I was an art major in college, <laughs> so I sort of started out thinking that I might become an artist. but. Um, I did, so I graduated from college with no marketable skills. Um, I decided, though, not to pursue art as a career, um, and then suddenly realized that I was born to be a librarian, went back and got my degree, and, and have been at NPR for almost 30 years as a librarian. Um, but I, um, I, so I tend to have a traditional definition of artist, which is, tends to be in the visual world, so wouldn't really even in, include an author. And of course, being a nonfiction author, I again feel a little bit separate from the idea, the concept of, of art. 
Um, but I had to write them in a way that people would be willing to read my facts, and I did spend a lot of time trying to polish the language, and so then I'm pulling from you know what I learned in high school and college and what I've read myself and what, what good writing I've been exposed to, and so I, I guess, yes, there's some artistic aspect to it. Terrific. Well, the art that I was pointing to was not necessarily the visual arts, but the art in terms of your point, Joanne, about people having to create their own careers. And Key, you, you are creating your own career as an author. That's oh, true, it's true. We only have a minute or so left. Um, either of you, would either of you like to leave our viewers with any last minute advice? Read. Read and learn, <laughs> continue Read and to learn. learn. I mean, yes. decide what it is you want to do and go for it. Our, our uh, slogan at Howard Community College is you can get there from here. And I say you can get there from all kinds of places. That's so right. just, just right. get there, that's, that's the right. end. That's right. And, and, you know, exactly, um, use the resources that are available to you. And now that doesn't just mean what's on your own street. It can be what's across the country, what's around the world, what's ancient history, what just happened today. And I think libraries, I certainly hope, will continue to be a very important part of that process for everybody. Well, I'd like to thank you both for coming on the show. Thank you. Today. Thank you. If you would like additional information about Joanne Hawkins or Kim Molesky, please visit howardcc.edu or keymoleski.com. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman and you've been watching Higher Education Today.